There are leaders that know how to start, build, mm -hmm. grow, mm -hmm. accelerate. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole other subset of leaders that maybe aren't built as much for that as they are to go in and take something that was broken, mm -hmm. similar to a Nehemiah going in and rebuilding something that he didn't break. Dr. John Chastain, great to have you on the podcast. I am so honored to be here. Thank hey, you so much for having me. I'm excited to have you. I gotta start with the obvious question, like how did you lead a church and serve as a president of a university for five years and not die? That's a great question. Um, I think I think a big part of that, not to over-spiritualize it a little bit, but is the Lord was in it, right? There was a grace on it. Um, but I think there was a, a big portion of that is just learning how to delegate and listening to this podcast and other leadership podcasts, but learning the concept of pushing, as you always say, push decision-making further down into the organization mm -hmm. and just surrounding myself with great leaders and trying to get out of their way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Not overcomplicate it, right? Right. Yeah. And and it was impressive to watch because you, not only was it multiple organizations, but in multiple cities. Yeah. And to do that well and continue to be a good husband and good dad, it was, it was impressive to watch. Yeah. Uh, along the way, um, we've been friends for quite a few years and um, both professionally and then personally, we've done stuff together. And so we were talking um, away from work one time and mm. recognized kind of a pattern in your leadership that you didn't choose it, mm -mm. but it seemed like you would often go into kind of like a leadership assignment that was after uh, maybe a season of complications. Yeah. And we started to put language to it. You want to maybe just tell our community the story behind Absolutely. what you started to discover. Absolutely. It really was a pattern that really you helped me realize is that I had been in, in, in profession for several years. I'd been a VP at a university. I'd been a, a pastor. I'd been a president of a university. And we were talking about launching, starting, and trying to help pastors and leaders learn how to launch and start. And I think I said something along the lines to you of, I don't, I don't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. And you said something along the lines of, well, then what is it that you do? Mm -hmm. And without even thinking, something just kind of bubbled up out of my gut with no filter, and I said, I fix broke stuff. Mm -hmm. And that just began this conversation where I began to realize that I really do think that I have a special gift set, and I think there's actually a lot of leaders that do. Mm -hmm. There are leaders that know how to start, mm -hmm. build, mm -hmm. grow, mm -hmm. accelerate. Mm -hmm. And then there's a whole other subset of leaders that maybe aren't built as much for that as they are to go in and take something that was broken, mm -hmm. similar to a mm -hmm. Nehemiah going in and rebuilding something that he didn't break. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a gift set, and it really was a pattern that I began to see, and I began to write about and study about, and it became a passion. Yep. You know, I, it's like I'd been all of these things, and I I was 43 years old, realizing that I finally know what I'm called to do. Mm -hmm. It was like a, a light bulb moment. Yeah, and it was fun to be there with you when you yeah. kind of saw the light bulb. And and what's interesting is, you know, so often if you're a good if you're a student of leadership, we're listening to similar podcasts, we're reading similar books. Yep. And there, there seems to be similar stories. Mm -hmm. I started with nothing. I took the faith risk. I built something, and here it is. Yeah. And so we tend to think that's the typical model of leadership, when in reality it, it is a model. Mm -hmm. But there are tons and tons of varieties of what we might call leadership assignments, leadership giftings, yep. et cetera. And, and I don't want to do too much talking, but... Um, at Life Church, we have 45 different church locations. Yep. So if you can imagine, we have some that are less than two years old, and they're kind of in the startup phase. We've got some that are 25 years old and have been mm -hmm. in a mature phase for a long time, maybe uh, some that are growing, some that are flat, some that are declining. And for years, I kind of thought good leadership was good leadership, and it took me a while to start to recognize now, there are actually some leaders that are really, really good at phase one. They're really, really good at the launch phase. But if you put them in a 10-year old organization that's, right. that's very stable, they'll almost self-destruct. That's right. They, 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 get, they get bored. At the same time, you put someone that's really good at running effectively and efficiently a stable organization, and you ask them to start something up, and they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. Then, on the other hand, you've got some that maybe they started to struggle and you need to bring in a totally different um, leadership style. And we we started to call them, call, call them like correction specialists. Mm -hmm. So you've got people that are launching, you've got people that are good in stability, and then you've got people that come in and like you say, fix stuff that's broken. Absolutely. And the reality is we don't hear a whole lot about that. I mean, who, mm -hmm. who 
talks about, what podcast talks about that regularly. Yeah. And you've devoted an entire, really kind of a branch of organizational development to it. You have podcasts, you've got a book coming out. The book is, or maybe even out now, depending on when we drop the podcast, called Releader. Yep. And the subtitle is... How to Fix What You Didn't Break. Yeah, in fact, I'll hold <laughs> it up right here. Yeah. Um, how to Fix What You Didn't Break, which is, it's a very different skill um, set. What's interesting is when you start something and you have problems, you're fixing the problems that you allowed or created. Mm -hmm. But when you come in and follow something that's not working well, you're actually fixing something that you did not break. Yeah. Uh, as someone who's done this multiple times, let's go kind of through the basics, John. Yeah. What are some of the first lessons that you learned that weren't as obvious to you then, but they're more obvious to you now? That's a great question. I think um, when you first come into an organization, and it can be a department, right? You could be a vice president or a lawyer or a doctor or a campus pastor. Mm -hmm. You're coming into something that you didn't build, and it may or may not be broken, but mm -hmm. you're coming into a, I walk through the halls of the church. I used to walk through the halls of the university and be well aware that I didn't build this. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't in the planning meeting. I didn't, I didn't, Pick the infrastructure. I didn't choose the core values. I didn't write the policies and the procedures, and I didn't hire the staff. Mm -hmm. And so you come in very aware of something. And I, and I think one of the biggest things that a real leader has to face primarily beginning is that an entrepreneurial leader can come in and be just blaze, just go. Everyone's with you. The vision has been cast. You handpicked all these people. You wrote the values, and everyone's rearing to go. And a lot of times a real leader comes in, and there's trauma potentially, mm -hmm, right. or there's just a, a history. Somebody, There was somebody there before you, and so they're used to that person's leadership style. And I think I use the analogy sometimes of a, of a, of a cruise ship, right? So if, if you become the captain of a cruise ship and you've got 3,000 people on this ship, the captain may know that we're going north, we should be going west. Mm -hmm. But the best captains know how to turn the ship so carefully and so slowly that you don't throw anybody off the ship. Mm -hmm. And so the best captains know how to turn the ship and no one even realizes the ship is turning. Mm. And so real leaders really have to have this ability to, to be pastoral or caring in a sense while simultaneously seeing where we need to be going. The best leaders, any, any leader can see this is the direction we're supposed to be going. We're supposed to be going west. Mm -hmm. The best leaders know not what to do, but when to do it mm -hmm. and how to do it. And I think that's really something that I've learned um, in releading is – not necessarily what, that's usually the easy answer, how uh -huh. and when. And you see staff members that you wouldn't have hired. Well, when's the best time to let them go? Uh -huh. Because they have a history. Do you know the history? Uh -huh. Do you know who loves them and who doesn't? Do you know their their their, their history and their understanding of the organization? So there's, there's a plethora of those sort of conversations and decisions uh -huh. that a leader has to make. You can't just come in and wipe the slate clean. Right. You can if you want to. Uh -huh. But you're going to lose trust very quickly. Mm -hmm. And your primary thing is I have to build trust. Mm -hmm. I cannot move this organization forward if I haven't established trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's interesting is when we first started talking about your idea together, we kind of recognized that the vast majority of leaders will have assignments like this, right? Yeah. M most, most. Most will come in after mm -hmm. an organizational head uh, or they're going to take over department. And, and sometimes they follow – kind of a catastrophic leadership season. Yep. A lot of times they just follow an average one. Yeah. Be, you know, just another kind of normal year. And like we recognized, you know, on that first day we started talking about, there's there's not many people talking directly about this. And mm -hmm. yet this is probably the most common assignment that leaders get. Yeah. So you said they're going to turn it slow. I'm going to ask you some specific questions about it. Is it always slow? Is there ever a time right. that it can be right. a rip the Band-Aid off? Or is it always slow? And if it's not, when would you go fast versus when would you go slow? It's a great question. I don't think it's always slow. And sl slow may not be the best choice of words, right? If I use, When I use that word, um, maybe strategic is a better word. Mm -hmm. So so let's just use the example of um, topics or, or staff or systems that are in your organization that are causing problems. Let's, let's use this analogy of, of like cancer, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say that you go to the doctor and the doctor says you have stage one, stage one, and we're going to do the surgery three months from now. You may be like, okay, that's no big deal, right? It's, it's stage one. Mm -hmm. We've caught it early. You could, you could wait three months mm -hmm. versus if you go to the doctor and they say, this is really bad, you have stage four mm -hmm. and we're not sure how much longer you're going to live, but we can't get you in for four months. Well, you're going to have a major problem with that. Right. And so I think every situation is different, but the, if 
to use the example of a staff member, let's say you have a staff member and they are just toxic mm -hmm. and they're detrimental to the culture. Well, you certainly don't want to move slow. Mm -hmm. If it's a finance thing and you have a department that's overspending, well, that's you're not going to do that slow. You're going to cut that off quickly. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that it's it's more strategic than slow. Mm -hmm. But there are certain things that 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 when you answer the question, not what, but how and when, mm -hmm. that's when you drill down into every single one of those situations. And every one of them is a little bit different, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The one that I don't think, and I'd love your take on this, the one that I don't think you cannot wait on is building your leadership team, mm -hmm. the, the team that's around you. I know that in both organizations that I took over, Victory Church and the university, the very first thing I did was make some pretty quick tough decisions on my team. Mm -hmm. These are This is my team. I'm in the trenches with them. I am dodging bullets with them. That's one that I don't think you can wait on. Mm -hmm. I think you have to move very quickly on your lead team. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to backtrack a little bit and then yeah. I want to come back to where we were. So let's say um, there's a, someone listening right now and they're being recruited to come in mm -hmm. and take over something they didn't build. So uh, for example, I had a friend who was being recruited to pastor a church mm -hmm. And a lot of changes need, need to be made. And I told him, I suggested, hey, for example, the church had a horrible name, mm. one that needed to be changed. And I told him, hey, why don't you negotiate a name change if before. you're going to come before you're going to, they're going to mm. agree to it. And he said, oh, well, yeah, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Well, he didn't do it. Mm. He got hired there and he couldn't get the name changed. Wow. I would say that if you're being, would you agree, if you're being recruited somewhere, so you're not already in it, yeah. And there are significant changes. For example, can I hire my own executive team, right. or do I have what kind of freedom do I have? That's really good to hire fire. I, I think I would generally say, and would you agree? And you can comment on it that when you, if they're recruiting you, and yeah. if there's a lot that needs to be changed, would you would you agree that negotiating what is up for grabs yeah. at the beginning is wise? That's really really good. I think that would be incredibly wise. And and everyone may not have that luxury, right? If you're being recruited to exactly. be an assistant assistant director of a department, you may not have the luxury of negotiating on the front end. But I do think that if you're going in primarily as a as a CEO, mm -hmm. a, a lead pastor, a, a visionary position, I, I do think that that's very wise. And hopefully, you're getting the opportunity to meet with a board member, mm -hmm. or maybe you're getting the opportunity to meet with the board collectively, mm -hmm. um, or other or other people on your lead team. Mm -hmm. I think that that's a fantastic. Advice. I, mean, I would. I would want. I would want going in is as if this. Is, if I have the luxury of negotiating ahead of time, yeah. I would want board support. Yep. I would want, honestly, like as often as you can in writing. What is it's really you good. agreed to that that can change? Because here's what I found, and tell me if you agree or disagree. That a lot of times an organization will say, "Oh yeah, it's not working." John, would you come in here and fix it? And the mm -hmm. moment you start changing their their, their idea of fixing it and it's your idea of, fixing, idea of fixing it, fixing is, it. Is, is not the same. I think that's really good advice. And in, in both of my uh, experiences in that, one, the church, I, I I was already a part of the organization. I was a, I was a campus pastor before I became the lead pastor, so I had some organizational awareness there. The university going in, there were some of those conversations with, uh, at the time it was connected to Gateway Church. And so I was talking to, it still is, I was talking to Gateway Church leadership, talking to the university board. Um, you really want to do that legwork on the front end because you get in there and try to start move, maneuvering things and it's, it's too late. Mm -hmm. It's too late. Mm -hmm. It's 100% correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then you're going to get in and you're going to find out um, it is too late. You, you yeah. haven't negotiated something and things need to change. Yeah. Um, when you discover something that needs to to change, what's the first, second, third step? What do you do to discern? How do yeah. you assimilate a plan? How do you communicate it? Talk to me about the how behind actually leading real significant organizational change. Yeah, for me, both things, one of the first things I tried to change at both was I wanted to try to, to, to change the culture mm -hmm. of both. And for me, um, in the context of a re-leader, I had to get buy-in everywhere. So what that looked like for me was starting um, in my own mind with my own vision, going on a retreat with my lead team, getting their buy-in, mm -hmm. vision boarding this together, mm -hmm. coming back, depending on the size of the organization, and let's go down a second, third layer into the organization and get as much buy-in as we possibly can so that when when we have the all staff, when we get, meet with the event, when we meet with the constituency base, the board members, we have buy-in everywhere. And so I think... I don't know. I'd, I'd love your feedback, Craig. I think in re-leader, again, it goes back to this concept of do I need to move a little bit slower to get more buy-in mm -hmm. because of there's a history. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's pockets of the organization that love the old vision. They don't want your new vision. They like the old vision. 
And so they don't need to hear what the new vision is. They need to hear why, mm -hmm. more of the why. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's quicker when you're, when you're an entrepreneurial leader and you can just go, 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 go. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's l bigger levels of buy-in needed on a re-leader situation than on a, than a, a launch pad? I, I would say this. So like in, in our context um, at Life Church, years ago, we would do what you might call a church merge. Yep. And so there's a church that was struggling and they would say, can you come in and basically, mm -hmm. can you re-lead re us? And we haven't done one of those in probably over 10 years. We did several early on and the kind of the language we started to use is 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 actually easier to give birth than to raise the dead. Mm -hmm. Meaning if, something, if something's been struggling, yeah. we found that it was easier to go in and start something new than actually to change a culture. Yep. And, and I'll, I'll ask you about this, but first to answer your question, is what I found is there are some things that have to be changed immediately. immediately. Absolutely. If you don't get them done quickly, you're not going to get you them done. Will. And you almost have to pay the price, whatever kind of kickback there is. There are some things that if you don't do it now, they're not going to get done. I agree. Uh, there are other things that if you move them quickly, you're actually going to lose any type of relational yep. trust and, and, and buy-in. So you have to be really strategic. You have to be really, really wise. Yeah. At times, you want to act quickly. Most of the time, you actually want to be more patient. Yep. And you want to not just cast vision for the what, but over and over again, there's the why. Yeah. Any, anytime we're leading change, you've got people that are going to be advocates. You got people that are going to be resistant. You got people Absolutely. that are going to be neutral. So when you give the why, you arm the, those who are advocates. Mm. You reason with the people that are resistant, and you move off of neutral the people that are neutral. Hopefully, into That's a camp good. that makes things done. So um, back to your situation, you see something that needs to change. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Who do you assemble? When do you communicate? What do you decide? Are you making the decision? Is it a committee decision? Yeah. What What are your next steps? Yeah, I, I like to use this analogy that that helps me understand it better. Uh, is in in Silicon Valley, they they kind of came up with this term, is they build it in the air, mm -hmm. and that's really the the story of a re leader. You didn't get the luxury of being on the ground and building this airplane. And saying, is everybody good? Are we going to fly? Okay, let's get on the runway and take off. It really is something you sit down in the in the cockpit and this thing's at 20,000 feet and it might be on a descent already. It might be down. Mm -hmm. I doubt that it's up and to the right. It's usually level or down and to the right. Mm -hmm. And so you have to say, come in and say, okay, what parts of this airplane is not functioning properly? We're not getting the altitude we're supposed to be getting. And so if you start making really big moves too quickly, mm -hmm you won't stay in the air. Mm -hmm. if, if the right wing is not functioning properly, you can't chop the right wing off and put on a new one. You have to go in and piecemeal this thing very, very slowly. And so I think it's trying to trying to encourage, and that's why I said the lead team is so important because you have to get a lead team that are gifted in the same general areas of being great re-leaders. Mm -hmm. if, if you're doing this work where you know it's going to take time and you know this is a marathon, not a sprint, but you bring somebody in on your lead team that is just this gung-ho, rip mm -hmm. the Band-Aid off quick. Mm -hmm. So I, I really do think that it is a process of starting with the lead team, lead, lead team first, mm -hmm. get, building that team the best you possibly can mm -hmm. so that they can go and do the things that need to be done to build the plane in the air. What parts of this plane are not functioning properly. Some are easy to fix because it's internally and it doesn't if it doesn't affect our altitude. Mm -hmm. Some things on it you would know. Pastor Craig is a pilot. Mm -hmm. There are some things that you cannot change right. without devastating the the vessel. Right. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to talk a little bit about um, when you are making those changes. You're working with your leadership team and you want to um, implement an idea. How do you cast vision? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, is it we're changing immediately. Is it this is going to be a six month rollout? Yeah. What's 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 vision casting look like toward change? I think so much of a vision cast vision casting for a re-leader is is this caring for the the staff's heart as much as for the vision. And I know I know that um, in the context of the church. Okay, so the church that I took over, Victory Church, uh, my predecessor had a moral failure. Great man, amazing man, still is a great man. Made one mistake. Mm -hmm. And so when I come in on the heels of that, here I am needing to cast vision. I get I get approved to the staff. I get approved to the church in this context that that we're going somewhere, mm -hmm. right? There is a future for us. Mm -hmm. Simultaneously, I have to give space for these people to heal. Mm -hmm. They they are reeling in pain, mm -hmm. and so trying to find the balance between standing up on the mountain and saying we're we're going, let's charge, let's charge, right? Versus, hey, let's take time to heal. Mm -hmm. Let's take time to, to stop and to heal. And there's that process of trying to find, and this is constant balance. And on the Enneagram, I'm an eight. So it's like, let's do this today. Mm -hmm. 
uh, let's do it yesterday, in fact. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to find this crazy balance between how do I cast vision and take people somewhere, but not leave people that are wounded and bleeding. Right. And time heals, right? Time helps with those sort of things. But giving somebody, and, and, and I think that it's way, there's two kind of veins of releading, right? There's there's releaders who have to fix what they didn't break. And then there's releaders that might be even more difficult that have to follow the heels of a great leader. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. How do you follow somebody that was crushing it, mm -hmm. that was up and to the right, everything? Mm -hmm. I think that's actually way harder. Uh -huh. By the time I get into the organization and it's broken, uh -huh. people are starving for vision. Uh -huh. They're hungry for vision. And so it's a little easier. I took over the Victory Church in November of 20, 2014. And by February of 2015, we had cast a brand new vision, new values, new vision statement because there was a hunger for it. Uh -huh. At the university, it took a little longer. Jack Hayford was the history of our school. Uh -huh. Robert Morris uh -huh. was involved in our school. Uh -huh. So I think every every situation, that's the difficulty with releading, mm -hmm. is every situation is its own animal. Mm -hmm. So so many variables. If you're following someone that fell or fell apart mm -hmm. or the organization is struggling and, and the team is hurting, can you move them forward while they're healing or do they need to heal first? What I think you can like? move them forward while they're healing. Mm -hmm. I don't I think there's there's a part of their their brokenness. If if there was dysfunction in the organization, there was already a thirst mm -hmm. for vision, mm -hmm. right? So there's this process of letting them heal, but while we're going ahead and pointing to the direction mm -hmm. that we're going. Mm -hmm. Right. I think you can do both. Yeah. I, I actually think that moving them forward is a part of healing. Hundred percent. And what's interesting is in organizations I've worked with, consulted with there are times when people, uh, organizationally, they've lost for so long, meaning yeah. they were struggling to be profitable, they were not missionally successful, whatever it is, they've lost for so long, it's almost like they've forgotten how to win. Yeah. And you almost have to teach them how to win. Yeah. Talk to me through, what does that look like? How do you, how do you change the mindset from we're always gonna struggle to mm. we actually can have a winning season? You know, I, I think of, of course, I'm a pastor, so my, my context um, from time to time, I'll use the Bible for that. And I think that there's this passage in Samuel where where King David is having this this um, he's he's hiding in the cave of Adullam, and it says that the distressed and the disgruntled and all these hurting people were coming to him from Saul, right? And it says that they were about 400 in number. Well, what we what we learn later is those are the ones that became David's mighty men. Mm -hmm. And so they started as broken, mm -hmm. right? They started as reeling in pain. Mm -hmm. And God actually used that to create an army mm -hmm. for, for advance. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's it's very relational. Mm -hmm. I think I think David was relational. I think great re leaders are relational. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to it's hard to relead um from not being in the trenches with your troops for mm -hmm. a season, mm -hmm. you know, are you are you in there helping bandage wounds yourself? Yes, and showing that you're not. I'm not just here mm -hmm. to be profitable. I'm not just here to grow. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, we're here for that, mm -hmm. but I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. And what I've learned is that the people that I bled with uh, end up being my greatest warriors. Mm -hmm. They will do anything for me. They'll take bullets from me mm -hmm. because when they were bleeding, I stopped and I helped bandage their wounds mm -hmm. and. Again, re-leaders have to realize that it takes time. Mm -hmm. it, we may uh, we may not go from here to here in the time period that you think and that you hope. And that's why I love this this concept of re-leading because I think there's a lot of re-leaders out there, Craig, or a lot of leaders out there that our only gauge of success mm -hmm. is looking at the Craig Rochelles and the Chris Hodges and the Elon Musks and the Bill Gates and the people who have started, built, and grown – and we learn so much from that. Mm -hmm. But there can be a piece of our hearts that think if we're not doing that, mm -hmm. then we're failing as leaders. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just not true. Right. It's it's not it's true. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. And re-leading is different. It's not better. It's not worse. It's just different. And mm -hmm. we have to do it differently and be okay with it mm -hmm. and know that that's our call. That's our call is to help people heal while we advance. So someone who has started from the ground up. Yeah, and built something. I look at relating and say it actually takes more skill, more patience. I have a tremendous amount of respect for. It. So anyone who really is a student of leadership will know it's actually harder to turn the ship than just to build one from the ground up. And so it's it is a it's a worthy calling. It's important. I, I want you to talk to us for a little bit about culture. Mm -hmm. it, it's really rare to see an organization that's struggling that has a really healthy culture, meaning yeah. chances are pretty good, the culture yep. um, is going to need detoxing, is gonna need some yep. improvement, is gonna need some infusion of life and health. 
uh, I have some theories on this based on a lot of experience, but I'd like to hear your theory. Yeah. Is first of all, like, how long do you think it takes mm-hmm. to really change a culture? And obviously, the answer is going to vary. There is no yeah, right answer, right. but can you do it in two weeks or does it take two years? Can yeah. you, and so I'd like a little bit of gauge to kind of help maybe encourage leaders that if yeah. they're a month in and nothing's changed, yeah. that's not <laughs> unusual. No, it's not. So I want to know a little bit about how long does it take and what do you typically do? Where do you start when you recognize this is not the culture that we want or need? Yep. And so we want to start moving in that direction. Just yep. unpack some ideas on that. So I would say, again, every every one of them is a little bit different. But in my experience at both the church and the university, it took me about three years. Mm-hmm. Um, and for some, that's super depressing right now. Mm-hmm. And for some, that's very encouraging. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember when I first became the pastor of, of Victory Church, I called uh, a friend of mine, Brady Boyd, who had taken over New Life and a deficit. He was a re-leader. Mm-hmm. I asked him how long it took him to change the culture of, of New Life, and he said five years. Mm-hmm. And that really discouraged me in the moment. Mm-hmm. But I really do think it takes time. Um, uh, what I like to do is, one, I, I, I really firmly believe that you have to first build trust. If you don't build trust in your organization, you'll never lead anyone anywhere. Mm-hmm. Once trust is established, you can really begin to make some changes. And I like to say, and so much of my, so much of my theory and philosophy on changing culture came from leaders like you and great strategy and great books. Um, but I, I really do like to say, and I'm not the first to say it, is it if I want to change the way people think and behave, I have to change the way they talk. Mm-hmm. And so, um, to me, that starts with core values. I have to, I have to start with redefining who we are. Mm-hmm. I remember calling you early on. And I was saying, can I make a core value in my organization something that we actually don't do yet? Because mm-hmm. right. <laughs> I was like, I feel like if I'm going to say this is a value of ours, we're lying mm-hmm. because we don't do this at all. Mm-hmm. And I remember you telling me, well, you have to change the way people talk mm-hmm. and you have to p- p- make it plain so they can run with it, right? Mm-hmm. And so we change the way people talk. We don't just write core values for the website and the wall. Right. We, we write it on our hearts mm-hmm. and we infiltrate it into the core value, into the culture. Tell me, how do you do that? What does that look like? So for us in the context of, I'll give you both in the church and then the university. In, in the church, it became, how do we make sure people are talking about this? Well, one, as a re-leader, I began coming in and speaking vision. And what I noticed is there would be certain things that I would say from the stage that I didn't even maybe realize the impact they were having until I would hear somebody talk about it in the lobby. Mm-hmm. So one time in a, in a sermon, I said, we pray big prayers to a big God and we expect big results. Mm-hmm. And I just said it in a sermon. I didn't think about it. It caught, uh-huh. right? So it, it, there's there's some universities in the early days. It was Princeton, a lot of these universities. They would build these campuses, and then they would go ahead and build the sidewalks, right? What they realized is that they'd build the sidewalks, and nobody walked on the sidewalks. People started walking the fastest way, uh-huh. and so there would be these. So then they started building universities different. They would build the university, and they wouldn't build any sidewalks. Uh-huh. And they would say, let's figure out where people are going to walk and then build the sidewalks where they're walking. Mm-hmm. So I don't think that's a great strategy for all of your vision, obviously. But there were a few of our values that I picked up that our church was saying mm-hmm. is a value of ours. Yes. So it was a part of our culture already, and I liked it. So mm-hmm. let's – now, that maybe that's unique to you, re-leading. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Well, so it's an interesting thought because should your values be constant, and the answer is yes and or no. Yeah. Meaning mm. th- there are certain things that if you don't value a few things over a long period of time, you really don't have any core identity. Yeah. But I'm also a believer that if you're going to be any, if you're correcting something or if you're going to be somewhere for 10 or 20 or 30 years, you might – pick up a value along the way that's kind of like a discovery. Right. Like the, people are walking on this path and we said yep. it now that, that there's, this really matters more to us than we realized. Yep. Or there are times when you start with a value and you recognize, yeah, we're kind of just faking it. Like we really don't believe in it. And it's better to tell the truth and say, let's just not claim it and, and we're I think not living it. I think it's good for leaders to hear us say that. Like, it is. They think that once it's written, we can't change it. It's not It's not like the Ten Commandments, right? It's a breathing or, It's a breathing document yes. in a sense. Yeah, I, I call it unmaking a promise, that you make a promise and then mm-hmm. there's sometimes where you say you're going to unmake it, meaning like That's good. for the last 10 years, we've always said this and that was true for the time and the purpose mm-hmm. we are. The world has changed. We've changed. We recognize some changes. So yeah. we said we're always going to do that and we always did it when we said we're always going to do it, now we're actually going to make a change. I'm yeah. going to unmake that promise, and here's a new one, new direction. And so we, we don't want to do is we don't want to ever not be true to our word, but we mm-hmm. also don't want to box ourselves in yeah. with naive statements early on. M- m- most younger leaders 
tend to speak in absolutes. Yep. Once you do it for a while, you learn to right. like, like soften your language a little bit. Right. And so I had a lot of absolutes that over time I had to say, hey, that was absolutely true during yeah. a season. Yeah. And if we are if we don't recognize we're in a different season right now, we're yeah. going to um, underutilize the opportunities that we have in front of us. Yeah, I wonder if if creating culture and changing culture, I know, I don't wonder, I know that in, in the church context, I would think, okay, I would think that it's a little bit easier. I have this captive audience every single weekend. I can get up and I get a microphone and they're just sitting there listening to me. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the business world, you know, imagine a businessman or woman who has 3,000 staff mm -hmm. and they're all over the country, right? And, and you're not having this captivating moment. And, and how do I change the culture within my organization? At the university, it was a little bit different, right? So I've got students everywhere. I've got faculty and staff everywhere. How do I change the culture? And mm -hmm. so for us... As a leadership team, we we went through a book. You'd be familiar with it. I can't remember the author. Um, Made to Stick. Mm -hmm. um, Chip and Dan. Heath. Chip and Dan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we went through that and said, okay, this needs to be so sticky that when we roll it out, it's it, it it they want to adopt mm -hmm. these core values. Mm -hmm. And so we went away as a leadership team. We come back. We meet with our second tier of leadership team. We have an all staff where we're basically we're going through every step of the process so that everyone has buy in. Mm -hmm. Once we we came back with eight core values, we mm -hmm. chiseled it down to seven. Mm -hmm. And then we went to our marketing team mm -hmm. and we said, hey, we're, we're old, we don't know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Help us make this sticky. And they actually took seven down to four, mm -hmm. we call it our core four, mm -hmm. with icons, they, we got them down to one word, mm -hmm. one word. And then under that one word was a couple of key things. Mm -hmm. And that stuck, mm -hmm. it stuck. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think the church, I would think you could, Correct me, I would listen to you because you're Craig. I would think that the church world is you approach it a little bit different than than other contexts, maybe. Mm -hmm. you know? I, I think you're right. In the church world, you have you speak to the same congregation for the most part week over week. Yeah. And then if you take a like a massive business organization that's got a hundred franchises, how do you, you speak deep into those teams when they may not even know the name of the CEO, the employees that are working so there? So true. And so it, it it there's advantages and disadvantages yeah. of um both. On the culture part, yeah. you mentioned something that you just said in passing that is super, super valuable. You said, we all read a book together. Mm. And uh, one of the fastest ways to move people in the same yeah. direction is to give them a common experience yep. or common language. Yep. And one of the most underutilized tools that I've seen in, in leadership is reading a book <laughs> together <laughs> or um, watching a podcast Watch this podcast together, together yes. and discuss it or yeah. going to an event together. And yeah. sometimes it's not even what the speakers say at an event. It's That's what right. happens on the plane ride there or the, or the drive back. Yep. But as often as you can, you want to expose people to an idea together. Yep. And it's not that you're explaining, hey, I read this book and here's what I read, but we read it together chapter by chapter, page yeah. by page, and then discuss it. And that's a way, like literally, we have massive values and massive systems in place. I can name the book and the year yeah. that we read it that changed everything. I would even, you said made to stick. Are there any other books in your mind that stand out as books that have helped shape your team organizationally over time? Yeah, I think there's uh, just a lot of the classics. You know, I know when we were when we were at the church when we were really wrestling through staffing, um, we really leaned on Collins, good mm -hmm. to great, and mm -hmm. this. The, and I think that's a great book for re leaders because you're you're hopping on a bus that's already full, mm -hmm. right? And so you're hopping on buses, going who's in who's in what seat. I know yeah, for right, me right, when right, I stepped right in, mm -hmm. there was a lot of people that I didn't fire, mm -hmm. but I just realized really quickly that they're just in the wrong seat. Yep, they're just in the wrong seat. And I love what you said about teams doing things together, mm -hmm. and and. What I thought of when you said that was even in the context of working out, right? So if you if you worked out your same muscle the exact same way over and over again, right. you're never gonna grow. Mm -hmm. And so I love it on, on the on the rare occasion now that we get to work out together. I work out with you. We're, you work out different than I work out. And so it, it stretches me in a different Con way. Consistent variety. Yes. Like call it. Consistent and we variety. get in ruts. We yeah. just do. Yeah. We just do. Mm -hmm. We don't see what we don't see. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it just takes getting on a plane, going to a conference, mm -hmm. and it's not – the session maybe at the conference that you're going to grab it is at the hotel that night right. when you're sitting around yep. Yep. and you're realizing you're seeing things together. Yeah. So. And, and when you're trying to lead change, sometimes it's similar to parenting. Like 
as a parent of six kids, I can't tell you how many times, John, and you probably can agree, you tell your kids something that it'd be in one ear and out the other. And <laughs> Until. then someone else says the very same thing. And they're like, oh, you know, my youth leader said this. And they, yes. they're like, I've been saying I've that. I've been saying that for And years. so that's the same thing. One of the greatest ways to bring in new ideas mm -hmm. is to have someone else bring in the new ideas. Yeah. Bring it in through a book, yeah. bring it through a podcast. Yep. And then it's not you saying it as the you know, the boss is just trying to get your way. That's right. It's actually someone that the whole organization respects. That's right. I, I want to talk to you about qualities of re-leaders because there are going to be certain makeups, mindsets, patterns, experiences. Some people are like better at re-leading, yeah. rebuilding, reorganizing, revision casting, renewing, yep. and others aren't. Uh, if I've got someone listening right now, I said, maybe I might be kind of like good at that, coming yeah. in and fixing things that I didn't break. What are some of the qualities and the best free leaders you've seen based on your research? Yeah, I think, and, and I, before I say some of them, I want to I want to make sure and and say that they bleed, they bleed over, it, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm not saying that if if you have these qualities, you're not a good leader. You're you're a re leader. They 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 obviously blend over. But I think re-leaders have a, a, a real discernment of looking at situations and being able to see things very quickly, mm. right? And and leaders have that too, but I, I mean in the context of, of looking at something and seeing where something's off. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be somebody that can look at a puzzle and somebody's trying to put a piece of put a puzzle together that's been broken apart mm -hmm. and they can piece it back together very mm -hmm. quickly, mm -hmm. like a Rubik's Cube or something. Mm -hmm. They have this ability to see things that are broken and see not just see that they're broken, because that's the thing. Anybody can see that it's broken. It doesn't take a genius right. to see something as why they see, why, they see what broken. it takes to make it. What does it take mm -hmm. to put this thing back together? Right. And 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 so I think they have that quality. And do do they often see the whole like here's the next eight things, or do they just see the next thing? Usually they can see uh, how this department is tied to that department, and if I make this change, how is that going to impact downline? Mm -hmm. So if I'm gonna, I'm, I'm going to push you in a way maybe no one has. What is that? Oof. Mm -hmm. I leave it up to Craig to push me in a way that. Mm -hmm. Like what? Um, what is that? Is it a connector? Is it someone that sees patterns? Is it logical progression of thought? That's. Is it? I like that. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> I love that you gave me examples. I need mm -hmm. multiple choice questions. Mm -hmm. um, I do love that. That mm -hmm. there is this. Um, I can see logically how things fit together. It's okay, almost so like an engineer. Logical progression of thought. Yeah. So maybe it is. Maybe maybe it is a. It's like a deductive some, reasoning. Yes. Or a. Or an engineer can see how things go, and if that goes well, mm -hmm. these th three things are going to be impacted by yeah, that. Yeah, so I, I think it's like I see what is likely the next three steps. Yeah. And if I'm wrong on step two, there's actually two options that I see. Right. That's got to be one of those two. And then once I go to that third step, then it's probably this, yeah. and it's probably going to take the fourth. But if I'm wrong there, there's this other option. So there's kind of like a – it's almost like running an option play yeah. as a quarterback. You take the ball – you read the defense. That's really good. And yep. you determine am I holding or am I passing? Am, or I, handing am it I passing? Off. And so it's it's like I think it's like reading in real time yeah. what's taking place. Whereas someone who's starting from scratch, there's more of a blank slate. You don't have a blank slate. No. You, you've got you got the pieces of the puzzle right that are there. And you there. got you uh so I've got a brother in law. To, to kind of piggyback onto another one. It takes that. It also takes patience. So my brother-in-law, you, you know people that can fix anything. They're just good with their hands. And there's people like me or you that may get frustrated really quick. I can't fix anything. <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. No, case. no, it's, it's horrible. It's horrible. My brother-in-law can sit down at a car that's broken. Mm -hmm. He just knows it won't start. He doesn't mm -hmm. know why. Mm -hmm. But he has the patience to sit there for two or three hours mm -hmm. and go to the parts store and come back. Nope, yeah. it wasn't that. Or go, find, re, go watch a YouTube video and figure out how to fix. He'll he'll, he'll find he'll the figure tools. It call out. the right person. Research online. He'll figure. So it out. is it a, is it a gift? Is it instincts? Is it patience? Yes, yes, and yes. Mm -hmm. It's a combination of a lot of different things coming together, and that's why I think it's so important for us mm -hmm. to start seeing Releader as a calling. Mm -hmm. It's a calling. Mm -hmm. it, it is a calling. The mm -hmm. people. And, and a lot of times, re-leaders aren't known. Mm -hmm. Their names are not in the spotlight, right? So we know who built the temple, yep. to use the Bible again. Yeah, we, we know it's Solomon. Know who rebuilt it. Yeah. Nobody knows. Right. Very few people know yep. who rebuilt the temple. Yep. Right? So let me ask you this. Is it um, a natural gifting, or is it something that can be developed and taught? It's a great question. I think that there's, I think that there's a portion of it that can always be developed and taught, because mm -hmm. the truth of the matter is we're all re-leaders. Mm -hmm. Um, we may not relead an organization. We may relead our marriage. Mm -hmm. We may not relead our marriage. We may relead my mind. Mm -hmm. 
it, the truth of the matter is we're all read leaders every day. Mm-hmm. We we broke something, mm-hmm. right, that we mm-hmm. need to fix. Mm-hmm. I need to help someone else help fix their marriage mm-hmm. that they broke. Mm-hmm. So we're all either re-leading ourselves, because mm-hmm. we don't just re-lead organizations, we re-lead people. Right. And as re-leaders, we, we, sometimes we need to fire staff, sometimes they just need to be re-led. Mm-hmm. They've never been led, mm-hmm. they've never been given a chance. Mm-hmm. And so how do I know when to re-lead a person and when to fire them? Yep. So right? here, here's when re-leading is easier. It's it's difficult because you're coming in and you've got you didn't pick your team. Right. You didn't build a culture. You didn't create the values. You don't you didn't create the systems. You don't have a lot of control where the assets are invested, blah, 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 yep. blah, blah. There's a financial model that's already in place. That's where it's more difficult. Where it's easier is you come in with objectivity. Mm. You don't, have, you don't have an emotional investment. That's right. If there's a player that's, that's underperforming, right. you know, yes. you didn't hire him yep. or her, and so you're not as emotionally invested in them. How can you take that mindset into your marriage mm. or into your parenting Yeah. to where you're in a situation where you're actually so close to it that you lose objectivity? How mm. can you take the lesson from releading the objectivity you get and apply that to other areas of your life. I think it's, you know, you would never want to say this in a counseling chair, really, to give, to give advice, but for the context of what we're saying, you almost focus on the brokenness. Mm-hmm. You focus on realizing that this thing is broken mm-hmm. and it's broken to the point where somebody's got to fix this. Mm-hmm. And I believe that I'm called to do it. And mm-hmm. so it can help bring this objectivity of, you know what? I'm going to have to make some hard decisions. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have to have some hard conversations, mm-hmm. not because it's going to be easy, but because this thing's broken mm-hmm. and I need to do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also this thing in real eating that is, I have an affection for those who have started and built and grown. Mm-hmm. Like if if we were to interview you about the early years of Life Church, you could tell the sacrifice mm-hmm. and you, the bleeding and the mm-hmm. sacrifice that it takes. And so there almost becomes this, this is my baby. Uh-huh. It's my baby. As a re-leader, you come in and, and you're very like, this isn't my baby. Uh-huh. It, it creates this objectivity to say, no, I didn't build this and I didn't grow this and I didn't do those sacrifices. And I didn't I didn't miss my paycheck so that it, so that other people could hit payroll. Uh-huh. And so there's you come in with this, this thing's broken uh-huh. and God is calling me to steward it and to fix it. Uh-huh. And I think it's not the re-leader's job to really change the reason that organization was planted, right? In our context, the Lord spoke to somebody and started it. Uh So the Lord told them to start it with this purpose in mind. Uh The re-leader's job is to come in and say, how can I make sure that that still continues? Uh Just because there was one mistake, just because there was a season of unhealth, if the Lord wanted this to be established, how can I come alongside for a season, whether it's a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, mm-hmm. and make sure that this organization continues on mm-hmm. beyond me? Mm-hmm. You know. So I love that you know, we were talking when you kind of came up with this idea. Yeah. I love the fact that you initiated quickly, you researched, you've kind of become an expert on this subject by studying it for four or five years, and now you're writing about it, you've got almost like daily emails and you've mm-hmm. got a podcast and you've you've built trust with the community. That's significant. So you know how to speak to someone who is stepping in, but I also know that you have advice for the leader in there that is one step away from mm. not being the leader anymore. Yeah. That if they don't make some changes, maybe, maybe morally they're flirting with the edge. Mm. Maybe they maybe organizationally things are not working right yeah. now and yeah. they don't have the courage to change. What I'd like for you to do is give advice to the person who's in role mm. and in trouble mm. so that someone doesn't have to follow them and fix it. That's what really advice good. would you give that leader? Yeah, I would say to go back to your first love, go back to the original why. And um, I've been in leadership long enough to know that even as in the context of a re-leader, you can get so mixed up in the weeds that you forget the original why mm-hmm. in in you know, even at the university, I would get so caught up in leading the team and fundraising because that's really all a president does is mm-hmm. cast vision and raise money mm-hmm. that I would need to get up sometimes and walk the halls and poke my head in a classroom and go into chapel and stop a student in the hallway and have a conversation. And I would every time I would go back to my office with a new sense of, okay, this is why I do this. Mm-hmm. This is my why. And I think it's very easy for entrepreneurial leaders, re-leaders, anybody in a leadership context to become so wrapped up in the day-to-day that we just forget the original calling mm-hmm. to go back to that moment that mm-hmm. the Lord spoke, to mm-hmm. go back to that to that moment. And mm-hmm. the other thing I would say is 
if there's some sort of tucked away secret sin, Mm -hmm. whatever it is, there's probably something at the root of it. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you say it, and I firmly believe it. I think the hardest person we will ever lead is ourselves. Mm -hmm. And because we can talk ourselves into anything. And I would say that anything that's brought to the light can be healed. Mm -hmm. And anything that's left concealed in darkness grows Mm -hmm. in an unhealthy way. Mm And so I would say you you have – it's funny. I just listened to the podcast the other day. I wanted to listen to it again of Sean, mm-hmm. you and Sean, Pastor yep. Sean. Mm-hmm. And I love his vulnerability. I love his heart. And, and I think that's so key for any leader to mm-hmm. be able to, to be vulnerable, to mm-hmm. be open, and to continually go back to why did I do this? Mm-hmm. Why am I here? What's my calling? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you're releading and you're second-guessing mm-hmm. your own abilities, what do you say to yourself? I tell myself that um, this isn't about me, mm-hmm. right? This this isn't about me becoming known and me. Um, I think that's the fight of a lot of leaders. I think what we have to do is change our definition of success. Mm-hmm. And I know for me, it all happened again, another interaction with you where I felt like I needed more. I needed more to do, more influence, more this, more that. And that's what make great leaders. We want more. We right. want to do more. But I had to go back and redefine what success meant to me. Mm-hmm. And I have six things that I measure success by. What, mm-hmm. those, those six things that I know that if I fail everywhere else in life, but I'm successful here, mm-hmm. right? If my relationship with the Lord is strong, if my marriage is strong, if my relationship with my kids is strong, and these, these things. So when I begin to doubt my abilities, my, my performance, whatever it is in releading, well, what is success? Mm-hmm. What is success? And I'm being successful to things that really matter. Um, so those, that's, that's my daily pep talk mm-hmm. of trying to renew my mind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because we'll all get there, right? Yeah. And and um, ultimately, we have to do something different. When something's not working, I, I had a conversation with one of my kids the other day. And I was so proud of this one particular child because he or she, I don't want to give too much away, was, <laughs> uh, I'll just say he, mm-hmm. but he was hitting his head up against a leadership obstacle. Mm-hmm. And he said, um, what I recognize is what I have been trying has not been working. I have to do something different. Mm. And that was, that was just, that is such a self-awareness, prof- self-awareness. Yeah. And there are, there are leaders right now listening to this who've been trying to do better. What's not working at all. Yep. And you'll climb the ladder and get to the top of the ladder to realize it's leaned against the it's wrong wall. It's leaned against the wrong wall. But just because yeah. when you're when you're doing something ineffective, it doesn't matter how good you do it, you, you got to change it. And you got to have so the courage to, to, to make the change. And so yeah. I applaud you because you've made some big faith steps and yeah. I've watched up close how you have led very effectively and not visibly, not broadly well known, but that's where a lot of the best leaders are. They're all over the place listening to this podcast right, right now. They don't have tens of thousands of followers, but they are they have very effective, loyal, mission oriented organizations. And yeah. I, I love leaders like that. Me I love too. leaders that come in and do the hard work. And so the book again is Releader. It's out early uh January, mid January, yeah. mid January twenty twenty four, which yeah. is which is either already out in the future, <laughs> depending on when we drop this podcast. Right. But the book is called Releader, How to Fix What You Didn't Break by Dr. John Chastain. And I know there's a lot of people right now that go, I got to get more of this guy's teaching. Where yeah. do they find out about you? How do they get on your email list? Tell us tell us where Super we can learn easy. from you. You go to releader.co, releader.co, releader.co. Okay. Everything's right there. You have a lot to offer, fantastic content, um, and more than just good content. Uh, deep integrity and sincerity and um, the real life at home. So thank you for what you do. And uh, again, a sincere thank you to um, our leadership community just for trusting us with a little bit of your time every month. I want to work really, really hard to bring people that will add value to your leadership and work hard to give you content that will help you grow in your leadership and help you get better. You can get better. Whatever you're leading today, um, you may have some real challenges. And I want you to believe that you have what it takes and the one who can help you do it with you at all times. You can do what you're called to do. If you're called to relead, um, it's going to take a little bit more patience, probably a little bit more work, um, some more effort, but it's worth it to build something special. John, thanks for being on the podcast. You helped us get better, and we know that everyone wins when the leader gets better.